This is Christopher Cernike hosting episode two of season five of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins debate and host interviews with scientists. Today we'll be speaking with Dr. Marcus Ross about what fossils can tell us about dinosaurs and human evolution. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today on Current Topics in Science, we have the honor of hosting creation paleontologist Dr. Marcus Ross, the founder of Cornerstone Educational Supply. Dr. Ross has a Bachelor of Science degree in Earth Science from Pennsylvania State University, a Master of Science degree in Paleontology from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, and he obtained his PhD in Geosciences from the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Ross has served as professor of geology and the director of the Center for Creation Studies at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. So Dr. Ross is the author of numerous technical articles, essays, and book chapters with publications in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, Journal of Geoscience Education, the Journal of Creation, Answers Magazine, Answers Research Journal, Zondervan's Dictionary of Christianity and Science, Sapateya, and other venues. He's the lead author of the college textbook, The Heavens and the Earth, alongside Drs. John Whitmore, Stephen Gulmer, and Dr. Danny Faulkner. Lately, he's been involved in a number of debates, squaring off against Hugh Ross, Joshua Swamidas, Fazil Rana, and Michael Jones. Dr. Ross's expertise has also been featured in popular, award-winning, and highly acclaimed media publications and documentaries, such as Is Genesis History, Beyond Is Genesis History, Volume 1, Rocks and Fossils, and Creation Ministries International's Evolutions, Achilles Heels, which is available at a discounted price in the description of this interview. Dr. Ross currently resides in Lynchburg, Virginia, with his wife, Karina, and their four amazing children. Now, without further ado, good morning, Dr. Ross. How was your day, and how are you doing? Uh, my day is going very well, Chris, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here. This is a real treat, a real treat. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross, for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you on Current Topics in Science. And since this is Current Topics in Science, we're going to quickly look at this week's current topic. So according to a paper published in July of this year from physics.org, the oldest European human fossil has been possibly found in Spain. The article says, A jawbone fragment discovered in northern Spain last month could be the oldest known fossil of a human ancestor found to date in Europe, Spanish paleontologists said Friday. The researchers said that the fossil found at an archaeological site on June 30th in northern Spain's Atapuerca mountain range is around 1.4 million years old. Until now, the oldest hominid fossil found in Europe was a jawbone found at the same site in 2007, which was determined to be 1.2 million years old. The scientific dating of the jawbone fragment will be carried out at the National Center for Research on Human Evolution, and the process should take between six to eight months to complete, and the analysis could help identify which hominid species the jawbone fragment belongs to to help better understand how human beings evolved on the European continent. Dr. Ross, what do you think of this current topic? And how can creation scientists add to the body of knowledge when it comes to human fossils? Well, that's a great question. It's a very interesting new find from the, the small tidbits that we've been getting from the news so far. Uh, this is a, a tease, if you will. The, um, the full description of this new specimen has not yet been published. Um, I was on the website of the uh, paleontological uh, organization that is overseeing this particular excavation uh, yesterday, uh, and I know that they have submitted their uh, current findings to the, uh, to the journal Science. So uh, Science and Nature are the top two journals in the world for communicating 
New Science Information. So they're, they're hitting this with a top tier journal. Uh, they think this is going to make a big splash. And uh, so the location that we're looking at here is uh, in the Atapuerca uh, Mountains of Spain at a, a locality called Gran Dolina. And this is a fossil site that has been worked and excavated for a long, long period of time, 20, 30 or more years or so. Um, and it's yielded a number of different hominid materials. So this new discovery is supposed to be uh, a bit of uh, the maxilla, kind of the upper part of the jaw. I uh, saw a picture of it on their website. So they got a, a spot where there would be a couple of teeth that are missing and a little bit going up into the cheekbone area. So it's a small section. The translation said that they had a jawbone. I don't know if that means it's that section of the upper jaw or if they also have a lower jaw. Usually when I say jawbone, we're talking about lower, but be that as it may, uh, they definitely seem to have some fragments of uh, an ancient hominid. Now, the term hominin is used by archaeologists and anthropologists to refer to anything that is supposed to be closer to humans than to chimpanzees on the evolutionary um, kind of view of things. So when humans and chimpanzees are supposed to have split somewhere around five or six million years ago, anything that's on the line more towards humans is going to be called a hominin and the things going the other direction are not. So that's kind of the, the definition there for what a hominin is. Um, and that means that some things that we've heard about before, like uh, the Australopithecus afarensis called Lucy, for example, uh, that's one specimen of Australopithecus afarensis. That would be considered a hominin because it's supposed to be anatomically more similar to us than it is to chimpanzees. All of the different species of Homo that um, anthropologists have identified, like Homo erectus, uh, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, ourselves, we are all part of this big group called hominins. So think of that just as a big basket of stuff that has some humans and some non-humans uh, in it. And for this one, coming in at 1.4 million years ago on the conventional time scale, uh, which obviously you and I disagree on the overall time scale, but just in terms of more or less recent than the other things, even in that cave system. So Grandolina uh, has produced things like uh, Homo antecessor, uh, which is thought to possibly be an ancestor towards a few other things, maybe even to us and Neanderthals. Um, the Homo antecessor fossils are supposed to be just a little less than one million years ago. So this is bringing us down another almost half a million years on the conventional time scale. At that time around the world, uh, the only major hominin fossils out there are from Homo erectus. Uh, and it would be very interesting to see if Homo erectus has fossils as far out as Spain, because we see Homo erectus fossils in Africa, in uh, the Middle East, and um, very uh, Eastern Europe, the, uh, the country of Georgia, uh, and then going out far east towards places like uh, China and Indonesia. The original Homo erectus Java man uh, came from Indonesia. So this, this would be the species I would expect it to be um, if it were to fall into one of the already kind of established members out there. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. So it sounds like creationists do have a lot that they can bring to the conversation. And speaking of that, I want to highlight one of the predictions that you said in Evolution's Achilles Heels. Referencing the Cambrian Explosion, you stated... While the Cambrian explosion stands as strong evidence against evolutionary predictions, it's actually exactly what creationists would expect out of the fossil record. If Noah's flood created the bulk of our fossils and sedimentary rocks, then we would expect that as the flood starts in the ocean and then drives its way on towards the continents, that it would pick up these marine ecosystems, burying them in sediment and then driving them up on the land where they'd become fossilized and sedimentary rocks. So, Dr. Ross, it sounds like you're saying that the global flood model can make testable predictions. What predictions would the global flood make about human fossils, and have those predictions been borne out? Well, thanks for reading that, that section out of uh, Evolution's Achilles' Heels. It's very kind of you. Um, and, and I think that this is an important aspect for uh, young Earth creationists in particular to keep in mind, is that our focus should be on building a system of understanding the data of the world within a creationist framework, one that does in fact make predictions, uh, one that is testable therefore, 
uh, one that is falsifiable, right? That, that there are predictions that we might make about uh, our expectations that could be shown to be right or wrong. That shows that your predictions are kind of risky, right? And with great risk comes the potential for great reward. If our focus is only ever on how evolution is wrong and incorrect, then we're going to spend our lives following a moving target, right? Evolution today is not the same as evolution in Charles Darwin's time. And it's not even the same as evolution in uh, the period of the Great Synthesis in the 1930s and 40s. Evolutionists uh, continue to make discoveries like these ones in Grandolina in Atapuerca. And so they're constantly going to be adjusting their own perspective on things. So for creationists, it's really important that we kind of build our own house and don't constantly just point to the problems with somebody else's house. There's a, there's a point for that. There's a place of saying, hey, this is wrong and here's why. But if we don't have an alternative that is robust and well constructed, then pointing out that somebody else's hypothesis is wrong doesn't mean that we've got one that's right. So we got to we got to work on that. Right. So when it comes then to the hominid issues, um, we've got some interesting things going on for us. First off, I think actually that all of the hominid fossil record that we have is post flood rather than formed during the flood. Um, and this is the, the common perception of the hominid fossil record across uh, most creationists. Um, the major ministries, Answers in Genesis, CMI, ICR, uh, they all look at the hominid record as post-flood rather than flood. And that's because many times these fossils are found, uh, for example, in caves like this one. Uh, and you think about how, how do we get a cave to form? Well, we have to lay down rock, particularly limestone uh, is where most caves are formed. Well, the limestone is probably a flood deposited rock. We'd have to look at the particular one there in Atapuerca, but I know which one that is. And yeah, that's a that's a rock that was laid down during the flood. Then there has to be a hole kind of excavated in some way out of this. That's done by acids that dissolve parts of the of the rock and leave behind a hole. So it's not actually like a physical excavation. It's a chemical dissolving. And then that has got to be raised up to the surface so that the cave is exposed for people to go into it or whoever these hominins are have to go into it. And that's most likely gonna be happening in the post-flood period. So uh, between the caves and also the other sort of surficial gravel deposits and stream bed deposits that we find hominins in, the character and the nature of the hominin fossil record really looks post-flood. Looks like things have settled down a bit. There are still some regional catastrophes and problems for people. But on, on the whole of it, what we've got is uh, this is post-flood. So what we're looking at then are not um, Adam's children so much as they are Noah's children, right? They are the descendants of Noah and his family that are now spreading across the earth um, and going out into all the world. I mean, to get from wherever, uh, to from the mountains of Ararat to Spain, that's a good long distance to trek. Uh, to get to Indonesia is a good long trek. And it seems to us, uh, for, for some of us in creationism, uh, for example, myself, uh, Dr. Todd Wood would be another great person to bring on your program to talk about the hominid record. He's probably got, um, he's probably the most knowledgeable of this of anyone in creationism at this point. We look at this and think that actually some of these erectus type fossils that we see in um, the Republic of Georgia that we see in Africa, that we see in um, the Far East, a place like Indonesia, may actually represent the earliest members of uh, of Noah's families, of, of the building of his family out, um, because these are the first types of hominids that we find. So in a place like Grandolina, you find these hominids first, whatever they are now, I will we'll wait for the description. But whatever this, this one is, this is the earliest one. Then you've got another record at 1.2 million years in the same cave. And then you've got Homo antecessor. And then nearby, at least, I know that we also have uh, Homo heidelbergensis, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens. And they seem to be in a bit of a sequence. Now, the evolutionary community looks at that and says, this is part of the evolutionary history of humanity over millions of years worth of time. I think that it's actually uh, reflecting, if a sense, we could use the word evolution, the development and evolution of the post-flood people. And we may have a wide variety of physical forms amongst early post-flood people, much like we have a variety of forms amongst some of the different animal groups that were brought on board the ark and start to diversify after that. I don't think humans biologically are all that different 
that we also couldn't have a variety of different physical forms or go through kind of some changes that bring us to the physical form that we have today. So those are some ways I think that creationists in particular can be approaching the question of human origins and reading, you know, when you get a, an article like this and somebody says brand new human ancestor and we, we start to get worried like, ooh, what does this mean? You know, are the evolutionists lying to us? No, no, they're not. They're good scientists who are doing solid work. It's a matter of taking uh, the, the data and saying, how do we understand this? within a young earth creationist perspective. That is amazing, Dr. Ross. And while we're on the subject of human fossils, it naturally begs the question about distinguishing human fossils from the fossils of other creatures. So how exactly does one go about that? So for instance, the National Institute of Health says, at a protein level, 29% of genes code for the same amino sequences in chimps and humans the DNA sequence that can be directly compared between the two genomes is almost 99% identical. Dr. Ross, can you explain more about that? What is it that distinguishes a human being from, say, a primate? How can you tell human and chimp fossils apart? Well, good. that's a great question, Chris. Um, I'm not a molecular biologist and I'm not a geneticist. Uh, so when, when we get reports about how similar we are to, to chimps uh, in various ways, I mostly just kind of take those as a given. Those are people that are smarter than me don't, you know, talking about the things that they know. We do know that we have massive similarity on a genetic level with chimpanzees. And yet when we look at us and chimpanzees, there's this massive gap in our capabilities, right? We're the ones who have built cities around this world. And, you know, the population of, of humans is nearly 8 billion. The, you know, full population of chimpanzees around the world is measured in the hundreds of thousands. Um, their technology capabilities are very minimal. They can use a tool of opportunity, right, and maybe create a very crude tool, you know, hitting a, a taking a stone, hit something or, or what have you. Um, so the, the gulf between them and us is massive, even while the genetic separation between the two of us seems to be relatively small. Although we also share, you know, 80% of our genome, say, with a mouse, and you know, probably 70% with something like a fungus. So those raw percentages are are only so useful. So as a paleontologist, I think in terms of skeletons, uh, that's that's what I do. So if I'm thinking about humans and apes, I don't want to be too reductionistic, but thinking in terms of of their skeletal construction and us, we certainly do see some big distinctions, um, mostly connected to our mode of life and mode of walking around. So humans are bipedal. We stand completely upright, uh, hence the name Homo erectus, for example, as one of the, the fossils. It means upright man. That was the first fossil that had been found of something not like us deep in the record that stood up just like we did. Uh, Eugene Dubois called it Homo erectus. He was hoping that that would be the transition between the apes and people. Eh, it's not quite what he had hoped. Uh, but nonetheless, Homo erectus stands upright, the Neanderthals do, uh, Homo antecessor, Heidelbergensis, Floresiens is a whole suite of, you know, anywhere between eight and a dozen Homo species, depending on who's doing the counting, whether you group some together or split them apart. So what separates Homo anatomically from something like <clears throat> chimpanzees? Well, uh, chimpanzees, as you know, anybody who's watched a, a nature documentary has seen uh, they knuckle walk, right? They they walk with their knuckles down on the ground. They actually are working off of pads on the front end of their knuckles like this. And they have thickened skin there, kind of like we have thickened skin on the palms of our hand and the soles of our feet, since they do so much walking on that. And that mode of locomotion means that there's adjustments to the skull uh, as well. So if we followed our neck up to the point where it junctures in with our skull, we find that there's a big hole on the bottom of our skull. So we took our skull, tipped it up, we find a big hole in the middle where the spinal cord enters and connects to the brain. And there's a fancy Latin word for that that is foramen magnum, which means whole, big, right? It's, it, we're not trying to be too clever here. We're just using Latin because that's the language that everybody wrote in, in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the dawn of the scientific revolution. We decided that scientific documentation and scientific communication would be done in Latin and Greek because they were dead languages. So the frame and magnum is this hole where the spinal cord goes up and meets up with the brain. It's the big hole. And for human beings, it's directly underneath the skull. 
because our head sits right on top of the spinal cord so we can turn our head left and right. Now chimpanzees, on the other hand, that comes in at an angle because their back is sloped upward. It doesn't go straight this way. It's sloped like that. So the foramen magnum is located at an angle like this so that the head can look forward. So ours is straight underneath so that we can look forward and move our head. The chimpanzees still want to look forward, but that means that their foramen magnum is rotated about 45 degrees back to match up. So if you knew nothing else about a chimpanzee besides a skull, you would know a lot. You would know that the animal did not walk completely upright because its foramen magnum is in a different position. You would also see that it has very large canine teeth. Um, it has robust molars, has a very large jaw compared to us, tends to have crests down the front, uh, sorry, down the center and along the back of the skull to anchor extra muscles. Uh, it's got the big furrow brow ridge uh, going out there and a sloping forehead. So our foreheads are kind of flat for the chimpanzees. You get kind of this little knob and then the forehead goes back like that. If they went to you know do this, they just kind of like, you know, whiff it. There, there'd be nothing there. So when we take a look at that, those are some things we see that are different in the skull. We can also take a look at things like the hips and the legs, because, you know, if we're walking upright, our hips and our legs have to be organized in a way that makes that possible. So our hips are kind of bowl shaped because they form a support for all the guts that are up above them. And so they're kind of short. They're kind of bowl shaped, whereas the hips of a chimpanzee are elongate and following that kind of 45 degree angle. And they've got a lot of muscle attachments because the muscles are wrapping around the gut rather than holding it vertically. So their gut's kind of hanging this way and they've got to have good muscles coming around to hold in the intestines, hold in the stomach, that type of thing. So their hips are structured different. And likewise, so are their legs. If you've ever watched a video of a chimpanzee trying to walk upright, it looks a little weird. They seem kind of hunched back and they also tend to waddle back and forth a lot. And that's because, uh, first off, they've got to rotate their body back over their hips in order to stand upright. And that's going to put a lot of weight towards the back. And so it's going to look different from us who are already straight. And then the legs themselves, the femurs, come down very straight. So we've got kind of like that ball to the femur, and the femur comes straight down for them. For humans, that actually tilts inward. It's hard for me to do. There we go. That's a little bit better. So for humans, our femur actually comes in at an angle to come down to the knee to put our knees close to the center of our body's um, gravity and mass. And that allows us to take steps one after another. And when we move, right, our shoulders move just a little bit as we shift a few inches with each step, right? More if you're a macho guy, right? And you're gonna do the, the big Hulk and walk, right? But for the chimpanzees, they've got to sway a lot because their femur is completely straight. So when they wanna walk, they have to put all of their weight on one leg to step, and then they have to put all of their weight on the other. So it gives them this really weird look. But then again, if we tried to get down on our knuckles and walk, they'd be like, what are you doing? You do this is not good for you, right? So they're built different from us and we're built different from them. And we can see that anatomically. When we then turn to the fossil record of hominids, we can use these as clues for who was standing upright, who was not, um, we're, are we looking at things in the fingers and the toes to determine whether or not they could grasp and hold on to branches? Were they climbers? We're going to be looking at uh, material in the shoulder blades for that. The toes, are they all in a line like ours or do they have a thumb like big toe? Indicates that they were grasping and walking around. You know, when we look at, uh, at all of that, we definitely can see some primate, you know, some ape primates, non human type primates in the fossil record. But we also find that something like Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, um, stood upright. It's got its frame and magnum directly underneath like ours, uh, but it also has highly curved fingers and toes. And it seems that Lucy's species was probably living in the trees, um, but it was able to get around on two legs a little bit different from us, but still, you know, more like us than, say, like a chimpanzee. So that's one of the reasons why evolutionists have said, oh, look, this is a transitional fossil. Uh, but in the end, it seems like Lucy is actually doing some things that are quite different from you and I and the other members of Homo that I think are part and parcel of the human family. So, Dr. Ross, it sounds like you're saying that there are numerous important differences between these kinds of fossils. Speaking of which, there are also differences inside humanity. 
For instance, the Encyclopedia Britannica states that Neanderthals were a member of a group of archaic humans who emerged at least 200,000 years ago during the Pleistocene Epoch, about 2.6 million to 11,700 years ago, and were replaced or assimilated by early modern human populations, Homo sapiens, between 35,000 and perhaps 24,000 years ago. Dr. Ross, the Encyclopedia Britannica seems to be distinguishing between what they call modern humans versus Neanderthals. What do you think? Are these, as Britannica would say, archaic human groups like Neanderthals or Erectus human? How can you tell either way? Thank you. That's, that's, um, mm-hmm. that's a good question. And the term archaic humans is one that is commonly used amongst anthropologists, paleoanthropologists basically to refer to anything besides anatomically modern humans like you, me, or anybody else who's living on the earth right now. So we are considered modern humans, and uh, anything else is archaic in some sense. Uh, Other times, they'll use archaic to refer to anything prior to, say, the Neanderthals. Some, Some anthropologists are pushing harder for Neanderthals to be considered as human as you and I. I think that's a good move, um, and I think we should follow that logic a little further down. But just so your audiences know, when they see that term archaic human, they're always talking about some fossil thing that's not identical to you and I by having, you know, like this flat forehead on the front, uh, basically very little pronounced brow ridge, um, a rather short jaw, uh, fairly weak jaw compared to some others as well. And we have problems with our molar teeth. I had all four of mine removed. I don't know about you, but um, yep, I had mine removed because there isn't as much space in our jaw for the teeth that we have. Uh, Whereas if you look even at earlier Homo sapiens uh, jaw bones, they're more robust and don't have as big of a problem with all those teeth. Neanderthals have plenty of space for all the teeth. So this seems to be something that's actually happened to our species fairly recently, uh, probably with the transition to uh, going from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle into a more uh, agrarian lifestyle with lots of cooked foods you don't have to chew stuff so hard. And that actually, you know, that creates a mechanical strain on the body when you have to chew really hard and your body will actually respond to those changes um, over time. So the less that we have to chew, the fewer teeth our, our body seems to think we need. And so our jaws get smaller and then we have impacted teeth. Small problem here. Uh, but thankfully, we live in a modern time where people can take care of that for us. Now, as to um, are these archaic forms, to use that term, are they human? Well, I I think the evidence for at least some of them being human is quite compelling. Uh, Neanderthals, uh, from a behavioral standpoint, seem to show a lot of the same sort of technological capabilities that we do. Um, We know that uh, Neanderthals lived in, uh, in populations, usually small groups, that they hunted large prey, which they would have had to have done so in a coordinated fashion. I mean, they're going after things like horses, uh, rhinos, uh, et cetera. Those are big animals. I and mean, if you've ever ridden a horse, I, I grew up in the, in the suburbs. I knew about horses, but then I married a, a gal from South Dakota whose family owns a ranch. First time I ever rode a horse, I was 23 years old, and I got a chance to ride some bareback on it afterwards. And it was amazing. You could just feel all the muscles of this immensely powerful animal moving underneath you. And it really impressed upon me just, this is a big animal. This is an intimidating animal. If I'm one guy versus this thing, especially a guy from the suburbs, I'm intimidated right, by that. Her family, you know, not so much. You got to show who's, a, who's a boss, who's in charge. But uh, if you're going to go hunt wild horses, um, that takes some skill. And we know that the Neanderthals had a variety of different types of weapons that they used um, to do so. We also know that they manufactured um, clothing for themselves, skins of animals, and even recently twine was discovered at a Neanderthal site. And that's really interesting because in order to make string of some kind, what you have to do is take cords of material. They use the fiber from uh, some wood. These, These long fibers, they twisted three of those fibers together, you know, just twist them, twist them, twist them. But if you want to make a good cord, what they did is then took three of those twists and took them and then twist them in the opposite direction. So you have to know 
that this is going to work better, right? That you twist everything and then you twist again in the same direction, it all spins apart. But if you twist them together in one direction, then you take the three of them, you twist them together in the opposite direction. Now you've got a tight core. Now you've got some serious stuff. And that's a Neanderthal site. That's equivalent technology to what we see with Homo sapiens. We also know from a genetic standpoint that you and I and most people on Earth today carry Neanderthal genes with us. We have genetic signatures from the Neanderthals. We know that because the Neanderthal genome has been sequenced. There's been a couple of fossils that were so well preserved that they could get nuclear DNA from, from the Neanderthals and then compare that to the modern population. And it shows that uh, the modern population has got anywhere between one and 2% uh, DNA from Neanderthal sprinkled around inside of it. The only population that doesn't have um, substantial amounts of Neanderthal DNA are the people who live in sub-Saharan Africa. So Southern Africa has little to no Neanderthal genetics because Neanderthals were living in the northern regions of Europe and Asia and the Middle East. And so when Homo sapiens left Africa in order to uh, migrate, they interacted with Neanderthals and had kids and brought those genetics with them as they went around the world. But the people who didn't leave Africa never had that connection. And so it seems that the Neanderthals were either assimilated uh, in part or in some way outbred uh, by us. It, it seems that Homo sapiens populations were larger, Neanderthal populations were smaller. We seem to have gotten along fairly well most of the time. We don't see intraspecies fighting that we've at least been able to identify. It would be hard to figure out that in the fossil record, but we have no evidence of it. And we have evidence of interbreeding. Now, interbreeding can happen because people agree to it or sadly because people have not agreed to it. Um, but it seems to be abundant enough that at least some of this has got to have been purposeful um, between clans. So that would say to me, if, if we can breed with Neanderthals, then we are people, right? It seems like it's not complete breeding, but it's, it's breeding. Um, so I would say that Neanderthals, um, another group that we know of mostly from genetics, the Denisovans, um, there are some populations alive today that have up to 5% or more of their DNA coming from the Denisovans. So that's a different species. Although I'm just using the term species like an anthropologist would use it. I'm looking at these as all descendants of Noah. Um, and so it's not surprising that we have populations that kind of get started up. They're isolated from the others early on. And then later they blend back into one another a bit. And, you know, when people meet people, sometimes they just make more people. Um, and then, you know, we've got the older, um, the older species like Heidelbergensis, Antecessor, Erectus. And we don't have evidence for interbreeding with them because we don't have any genetic material from them. I'm quite convinced that if we did get genetic uh, information out of an erectus fossil, for example, that we would be able to identify the erectus genes that all other hominins carry. Um, I think that would be a very, um, it would be a really amazing discovery. And I think it's a very reasonable prediction from a young earth creationist perspective that we all are carrying a, a good bit of, um, of erectus genes with us. I think that is the flow from Noah to the modern runs through Erectus, not as some side branch that was weird, but actually that that was the normal branch. And quite honestly, we're kind of weird uh, physically. When you compare us to all the others, we're the only ones that don't have a big brow ridge. We're the only ones who have this really tall forehead. We're the only ones who have a really small and weak jaw. Um, I mean, we're highly intelligent. I think they were highly intelligent as well. So there's a lot of differences in our morphology but also a lot of uniting commonalities. Dr. Ross, if you don't mind, may I go off script a little bit? Yeah, by all means. Hey, we're having fun. Okay, thank you. Now, I wanted to ask you, speaking of high intelligence, you are a very articulate person, and I really do admire that. And so I was wondering, you know, a lot of people, I know I, I myself, like I'm not a paleontologist, so I'm reading some of these papers and I'm like, wow, these, this is incredible. These people are amazing. They really know what they're talking about. And I'm wondering how exactly can a lay person like myself approach these different papers? And as we're reading them, what are things we should look for? What can we hope to learn? Just sort of something along those lines. Yeah, well, I think among creation generally, um, and including also like intelligent design and some old earth views, there's a tendency 
uh, to be, I think, I'll, I'll say this, it sounds weird for me to say this, to be overly skeptical of evolutionists. My own academic history that you know you, you kindly recounted at the beginning, I went to Penn State, I went to South Dakota School of Mines, I went to the University of Rhode Island. I never spent a day in a Christian school until I got a chance to stand behind the lectern at Liberty University and start my first class. You know, it's like, we can pray, like in class, really? Wow, this is different, right? But what that means is that, you know, those who hold to evolution uh, were the the vast majority of everybody I knew. I was almost always like the only guy I knew who thought the way I did or one of a very small handful had a couple of my, there was always a couple of people around who didn't hold to say an ancient earth or to biological evolution, had some skepticism towards that. But what I learned with evolutionists as, um, you know, my advisors, um, as my classmates, as my roommates, as co-authors on papers with me and, you know, project um, companions, you know, just big friends, just basic friends is that, you know, these are sharp people who do good work, are careful about things and want to do good work, right? They're, they're not out there looking to deceive. And so I think we do them a disservice if our first reaction to a paper that we get is, oh, they can't know that. Oh, that's garbage. You know, they don't know what they're doing. That's not my experience. Um, my experience is definitely these, these folks are really sharp. And, you know, they sometimes run into things where they have big challenges or questions about evolution. They're not sure what to do, but they are convinced enough that, that the story makes sense, that that's, they think that's the reasonable way to go. So when we get a, a paper or a news story about things, the first thing that we should do, I think, and I'll follow after kind of Todd Wood and some of his writings about this, is that we should thank God that something that was hidden is now known, right? Psalms 25, I'm sorry, Proverbs 25, 2 says that it's the glory of the Lord to conceal a matter. And it's the glory of a king to search it out. We get to be those kings, you know, whether it's science, psychology, history, you know, whatever our interests are, engineering. If we discover something new, we have discovered something that God put in this world that maybe nobody else ever got to see before. That should be exciting. That should make us, you know, think, wow, I wonder what this is when this new hominid skull bit is is announced out of out of Puerca, our first reaction shouldn't be, oh, there they go again. It should be, oh, what'd you find? Right. I, I want to find out. This is this is exciting. Is Rectus all the way in Spain? I'd love to know that because it either had to trek its way over there or it possibly boated its way there. Because there's some interesting evidence that Erectus is actually capable of voyaging on the ocean. So did it cross the Gibraltar Strait? Or did it walk the long way and therefore we've got Erectus actually all over Europe? If so, why haven't we seen Erectus anywhere else in Europe? Uh, why is it in Spain? Or is this something totally new that we've never seen before? Um, so that's the first thing I say. Get excited when something new is discovered. And then, you know, think about how this discovery might fit within a, a young earth creationist, a, a biblical creationist framework. Uh, a great book to start that will help you thinking through those things would be Paul Garner's book, The New Creationism. It was published around 2010, 2011. And it's still an excellent summary of kind of where modern young earth creationism is in constructing an overall picture of stuff. It builds, I think, very nicely off of Kurt Wise's previous book, Faith, Reason, and Earth History, which is out of print. You can probably find a used copy here or there. Um, but Paul Garner's book kind of um, brings it down to a little bit more of a layperson side and updates it from when Kurt was writing um, as well. So those would be two books that I highly recommend, um, along with Todd Wood's book, The Quest, uh, which is all about how do you approach hard questions in creationism? You know, what is it that you do when you don't know what to do um, about that? And I think that's a, it's a really lovely personal kind of reflection. And there's these nice interspersed uh, between the chapters are these um, devotional reflections called an adoramus, uh, which in Latin means let us come, let us worship. Uh, he got it from a Latin hymn that he enjoyed uh, listening to as a kid. And, and so you get kind of like, here's a hard problem and I don't know what to do about it. And here's a praise of God. And here's a hard problem. And this is actually how we've gone about approaching it. We're not all there yet, but then here's another praise. And so it's a slim little volume, but it's really nice. My students have loved it. 
They've really loved the way that uh, he has a, a humble approach to not knowing things, and it's okay when we don't. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Ross. And I also appreciated how you really put the um, perspective of 1 Peter 3.15 as you share the faith, you do it with the gentleness and respect. I thank you for doing that. Oh, you're welcome. It, it's very, very important. You know, we don't want, I mean, we know that the gospel is an offense, right? It's an offense to the Jews, a stumbling block, uh, sorry, an offense to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews. So if I'm going to be presenting the gospel, I might as well let the gospel be the offense and not me, right? That's that's at least the hope um, in that. So yeah, thank you. Wow. And speaking of all of us together, to go back to our questions, I mean, the human family truly is a beautiful thing. Um, when we looked at our last question, we saw that basically evolutionary researchers They'd predict that human beings evolved maybe roughly, say, within 100,000 years ago, or at the very least, they certainly didn't exist, say, around the same time that dinosaurs did. Dr. Ross, do you believe that human beings lived concurrently with dinosaurs, and what evidence would lead you to conclude that? That's an that's a, a interesting question. So... When evolutionists say that our species arose 100,000 or 300,000 years ago, right there, or when they say humans did, they're speaking very restrictively of just Homo sapiens. So others are pushing that and saying you should be calling Neanderthals and Denisovans and maybe Erectus. You should be calling those humans. The word human now kind of it's it's like the book of Judges. Everybody calls it whatever they want in their own eyes. Right? You know, like, oh boy, this is this is getting weird. And so the question of humans and dinosaurs is a tough one for young earth creationists, because if God did create everything in six days and he created all of that only a few thousands of years ago, and the fossil record is a reflection of Noah's flood, then dinosaurs would have been made alongside man um, as beasts of the field, you know, a beast of the earth type of creatures during that sixth day. Um, and some, you know, other flying things and whatnot, you've got your pterosaurs and things like that that are on the fifth day and sea creatures on the, on the fifth as well. I would say that, yes, human beings and dinosaurs coexisted on Earth for at least the period of time from creation week, you know, up through the flood. Um, and it seems that the biblical text is saying that God brought two of every kind of animal to Noah, not just a small selection of whatever kinds he wanted. But uh, the language is mirroring the creation account very purposefully um, in the flood. So the kinds that are created seem to be the kinds that are being brought on board the ark, the same terms of creeping things, beasts of the field, birds of the skies, livestock. So I would think that dinosaurs would have been brought on board the ark, and therefore they have a shot in the post-flood world. I don't think that they lasted very long in the post-flood world, and uh, Kurt Wise um, presented a, a good reason to think why this was the case, why they wouldn't have lasted very long. And that is when you take a look at the plant communities that are buried along with the dinosaurs. When you take a look at those rocks that have dinosaur fossils and plant fossils, the plant fossils are very different types of plants than we see in the modern world right now. Uh, our modern world is dominated by angiosperms. That is the flowering plants that produce fruits and berries and nuts and things like that. And the dinosaurs, most of them are, in, um, are, are accompanied by plants that are gymnosperms that don't produce uh, those. They produce pollen, and and seedlings of, of certain types, but they don't produce fruit and nuts and things like that. So most of the dinosaurs are eating simply the leafy vegetation of these gymnosperms. Now, if it turns out that these plants don't do well in the post-flood world, then you might just be hacking out the dinosaurian ecosystem at its knees. Because if certain dinosaurs are accustomed to eating certain plants and don't have, say, the gut biota to eat other things, then they're not going to survive long. And the things that are their predators, the ones that are used to going after them, are either going to have to adjust and go after other prey items, or they're not going to survive long either. So we might have had a post-flood uh, period. That it, it's kind of like a disaster fauna. Um, after a big forest fire, like a really big one that wipes out the big trees, there's a predictable series of plants that grow over the next few centuries, starting with grasses, and you get some low shrubs. Um, you get small trees like birch and things like that that eventually give way to pines. And those pines blanket the area with pine needles, which stop more pines from growing. But oaks and maples and chestnut, 
those sorts of trees can actually survive in that acidic soil, and then they overtake the pines. And so I look at a mature forest over here in the Black Hill, uh, sorry, in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, and it was all oak. The elms are almost all dead, but it's oak and maple, you know, elm, those sorts of things, chestnuts. And there's no pines except for where people put them. Or the pines are the only places, are only in the places where the leafy trees can't make it, right? They're high elevation spots or places that are very cold through much of the year. They can survive where those don't. So I look at that as an analogy to what happens after the flood is done. There should have been maybe a series of how the, the world got established um, to mirror the creation week. But if you don't establish the right plants first, then you don't get the same communities as you had in the pre-flood world. And so I think that the dinosaurian ecosystem probably died out very soon after the flood, hundreds of years. And, and so we simply just don't have uh, much of a connection between them and us in the post-flood world. But I'd say almost nothing. So Dr. Ross, what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that humans, they were created alongside with dinosaurs on day six of creation. Now, there are other groups of Christians, as you know, who are like the old earth creationists or theistic evolutionists. They would differ with that idea. For instance, Dr. Swamidas proposes a genealogical Adam and Eve. The summary of the book on Amazon says that it explores implications of genealogical ancestry for the theology of the image of God, the fall, and people outside the garden. Dr. Ross, is it theologically accurate to say that there were humans who lived and died outside the Garden of Eden prior to or concurrently with Adam and Eve? Yeah, um, I would I would disagree on that. So, uh, and Dr. Swamidas and I have had a large number of interactions. Uh, I was asked to write a response to his book on the website uh, Sapientia or the web journal Sapientia. That's from the Henry Center at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And uh, so I was one of five authors that were writing a response uh, to his book. And then uh, Dr. Swamidas got a last word to, you know, respond to everybody and say he's still right. You know, that, that type of thing. Uh, it's what what we do. Right. So uh, if you want to get some of my thoughts on that, you know, maybe we can put a link in the description uh, to uh, where I find the genealogical atom hypothesis uh, problematic. Um, I find it problematic both on scientific as well as biblical terms. Uh, for the biblical uh, issues, you have to invent people outside the garden. And the Bible makes no claims that there are ever any people outside the garden. Uh, you have to rely on some very obscure passages and think that there are hints uh, that this is the case. For example, where did Cain get his wife in, in Genesis chapter 4? So Joshua Swaminath says, well, he could get a wife if there was a pool of people outside the garden. Well, he could, but he could also get a wife if it was one of the other, you know, siblings from Adam and Eve. And since they're created good, we're not worried about genetic mutations and, you know, um, genetic disorders for the kids or things like that. Um, you know, he, he talks about, oh, maybe this could explain who the Nephilim are. Well, the linguistic structure of the Nephilim in Genesis makes it quite clear that these are angelic beings. And uh, I, there's a lot of creationists who think maybe this is the sons of Shem versus the sons of Cain as the, the sons of God and daughters of Eve. I, I think that's a, a pretty hard road to go. This actually looks like a supernatural um, incursion of, of wicked angels, uh, those who have rebelled against God, seeking to do damage to the world in some way. And this is part of the lead up to why the flood happens in the first place. So there's an explanation for that without having to go to people outside the garden, either if you go with the Shemite hypothesis or if you go with the sons of God are, are fallen angelic beings. You don't have people outside the garden. Uh, when you look at Genesis chapter five, which is the genealogy of Adam, uh, what you find is that Genesis five, one through five, blends together elements from Genesis one and Genesis two into a single document. So and Moses is writing all of this. He's clever. He knows what he's doing. And he's basically telling us that the people who are talked about in Genesis chapter two are the same as the male and female, the humans that are created in Genesis one. He merges those two stories seamlessly in the genealogy of Adam by using his proper name, uh, by referring to male and female. He created them from Genesis um, chapter one um, by referring to the son, Seth, um, who is mentioned in Genesis four. So we have this nice continuity. We also see that with Jesus, 
when he responds to the Pharisees about the question of marriage and divorce. He quotes Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 together. So Jesus reads these two. He says, haven't you read, right? Tell the Pharisees, like, come on, guys, haven't you read? Uh, and that that's a phrase that's used 11, I think it's 11 or 13 times in the Gospel of Matthew. Every time he speaks to the Pharisees, he says, have you not read? But when Jesus speaks to the people, he says, you have heard it said. So there's a distinction that is being drawn by Matthew that when Jesus speaks to the people, they usually hear the law because it's being read to them at synagogue. But the Pharisees and the scribes are the ones who read the law. So there's a higher level of accountability to the scribes and Pharisees because they are the ones who read the law. The people Jesus is much more gentle with because they hear it. They don't get to study it so much. So when Jesus says, haven't you read that from the beginning? So he quotes Genesis 1.1, that God made them male and female. That's day six. And then he goes on to quote the end of, um, of chapter two. Moses has a parenthetical statement that says, for this reason, a man shall you know, leave his mother and father and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall be one flesh. So that's Moses writing a little addendum to the story of Adam and Eve and saying, hey, by the way, this is why we have marriage, guys. You know, this, this in case you're missing it, this is why we have marriage. So Jesus reads Genesis one and Genesis two together. And all of that indicates that Adam and Eve are the first two people of any kind. There are no people before them. There's no pre-Adamites and there's no co-Adamites. Uh, so on the theological side of things, you end up in a world of trouble by adding in people, not just with Genesis and this. So you said, well, maybe, maybe that's outside. Maybe they're just not talked about. Well, the logic of Paul in Romans and in 1 Corinthians is that only people who are in Adam, descendants of Adam, can be saved. So if you have Adam created with a whole bunch of people outside the garden, these people are sinning and doing evil. They're also doing good and right, but they are ultimately incapable of redemption. They are outside of God's plan of salvation. And the whole point of Jesus is that he is the, the capability of salvation for everybody who has ever lived. So you, you, when you pull on some of these threads in Genesis, you know, at first it might look like, hey, this doesn't really go anywhere. This is okay. You know, maybe we can take a different perspective on this and that might be okay. But there are other threads when you pull them that they actually end up connecting somewhere else in the Bible important, like Christology. I mean, that, you know, you start tugging the, the thread on Christology and you end up in a heretical cult. So you don't want to do that sort of thing. So uh, what I encourage some of my old uh, my old earth creation or my theistic evolutionist friends is you've got to be very, very careful with this text. You can't just add or subtract things in an experimental fashion and then claim, hey, there's no consequences here or this is no big deal. Because by the time Jesus lives, everybody's connected to Adam. So Paul can still say that we're all in Adam. That's that's not what the Bible is saying. All people through all time are connected to Adam. Um, Abraham is called to bless the nations because the nations need to be redeemed. Right. God's plan for them is redemption. So those nations across the entire world have got to be connected to Adam from the very get go. There's scientific issues as well. Um, Swami Das uh, constructs his argument in an unfalsifiable fashion. He puts Adam and Eve in this little nook where they can't be identified by science. So he can say they exist and science can't prove him wrong. Uh, he views that as a strength because it, in a sense, it kind of protects a, ca a capacity to sound like a young earth creationist. You can have a recent Adam and science can't show you you can't. I don't think that's a plus on the science category. Again, hypotheses are better when they're risky and they make predictions that could be wrong. And by putting Adam out in this little nook where it can't be evaluated by science, um, then the statement about what Adam is is merely a statement of personal belief. It's not a statement about facts. Um, there's also problems with his uh, genealogical modeling and how fast he can get Adam to spread throughout uh, the world today. The most recent and the most rigorous models simply don't allow that. Um, and he doesn't think that those models are correct. Uh, he thinks that older models, about 20 years old, uh, do this properly and we can have genealogical connections that get us everybody really quick. But um, I, I don't see how that reflects the current state of the literature in this. So um, even even if he was right that you could get a genealogical spread really fast, 
he still hasn't dealt with the fact that his hypothesis is unfalsifiable or that, you know, you have to do some significant damage to the biblical text uh, to read it this way. You, you risk some important Christian theology. Josh and I have, have gone round and round with each other on these things. This, this isn't something that, uh, you know, is, has been in a closet. We had a, a debate uh, with each other um, last October, and uh, we've seen each other at uh, four additional meetings. We had another debate in, um, in uh, January or February of this year. I just saw him last week. So, you know, we, we've seen each other a lot. We're going to see each other again at a theology meeting coming up. Um, this has been an active area of discussion with the two of us. Dr. Ross, we've actually now come to our final question. Actually, as somebody who is both a geoscientist and a Christian, what would you say would be the sort of take-home gospel message of, like, the fossil record? Mm, uh, the take-home f- uh, gospel connection here. Well, the fossil record um, is often referred to as the record of life, right? Uh, the record of life over time. Technically, no. Uh, it's, it's actually the record of death over time. Whether you're an evolutionist or a young earth creationist, it really is a record of death. It's just that they, uh, my evolutionary colleagues think that this record of death is reflecting the development of life over time, where I, as a young earth creationist, look at this record of death and say that this is evidence of, of the worldwide flood. And it gets part to a question of where does death come into into being, right? Uh, we're told that uh, Adam is the one who brings in death. Um, the passage in Roman is most specifically there in Romans 5, talking about human death, both spiritual and physical. But if we keep following Paul's logic through Romans 8, we come to the passage where, talk, where he talks about the whole creation was subjected to futility or frustration by him who subjected it in the hopes um, of looking forward to the redemption of us, the body of, and, and our physical bodies. So you have to ask the question like, well, okay, when was creation subjected to futility? Well, there's only one point in time when that happens, when God curses the ground, when he curses the serpent. And uh, those two instances of cursing the ground and cursing the serpent both reflect the two areas that human beings are designed for. That is the area of work. That's what the ground is and the area of dominion, and that's what the serpent is. So by cursing the ground and the serpent, God is emblematically cursing all the things over which we have responsibility. And so this is a cosmic fall. It's affecting everything. And seeing that in Genesis helps us make sense of what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 8. The whole creation is subjected to futility. It's groaning in eager anticipation for the redemption of the sons of God. Right. That's us. And I think that helps us make sense of things like the fossil record, that death is introduced, physical death, not just for humans, but for other organisms as well at the fall. And then we've got this huge pile of rocks filled with lots of different fossils in it. That would make sense from the perspective of a global flood. Uh, And obviously the evidence for a global flood and the Hebrew behind that and the rocks behind that, that's a whole other episode. Uh, and a lot of fun. But that um, that makes sense of the biblical narrative. Genesis 1 through 11 is a very seamless walkthrough of the early parts of the world's history that then transitions beautifully and really just slides straight into, you know, the account of Abraham and the patriarchs. There's a definite shift in kind of how the focus changes there from kind of everything and everybody and all to, well, now I'm going to bless all of them through this one guy. But it's one of the reasons why scholars have always had a hard time arguing for some sort of clear break between what they often call primeval history, the early history of the world, and the patriarchal history, because the Bible doesn't intend there to be any sort of break between one and the other. Dr. Ross, thank you very much for your time. It was an absolute joy. And to our listeners, thank you very much for taking the time to learn with us on current topics in science, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. You can find Dr. Ross's biographical information, his lectures, his papers, his YouTube channel, and more information in the description. And check out his company, Cornerstone Educational Supply, which produces science lab materials for homeschoolers, public and private schools, and colleges. Additionally, as mentioned, 
You can find the documentary Evolution's Achilles Heels at a discounted price in the description. You'll also find in the description a link to the official Christ Jesus Ministries merch store. Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.